So first of all, it's really nice to see all your faces. Thank you, Becky um, and Aaron and Pina for making this happen. Um, and um, I have to say, while I'm not uh, on Bronfman staff anymore, I feel very much at home in this Zoom room seeing so many faces. So thanks for the opportunity to, to teach uh, in this context. And um, uh, what I wanted to do together with you is uh, to learn a little bit about the Passover Haggadah, um, but really to think together about what does it mean to lead a Seder um, and what does it mean to lead a Seder this year specifically. So just to uh, give me a sense and to give each other a sense, um, raise your hand if you weren't planning on leading the Seder this year. If you weren't planning on leading the Seder this year. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you were planning on leading the Seder anyway. If the, this you were about to host. Hi, Nama. Yoela, Shira, Nick, Diana, Raish, Rachel, another Rachel. You can always say Rachel in the Bronfman environment. Sarah. Um, and now, um, so we have a lot of people who are leading Seders who weren't planning on leading Seders. And, and that in itself is a challenge and, and also really quite an opportunity, I think, in many ways. Um, and I have another question for you which is um, how many of you are thinking, you know, um, I, how do I frame this? Um, how many of you think the, re you have the family, your friends and family and specifically your parents could use some advice on how to do this Seder without you guys? Uh, if that's something that's on your mind, I know it's something that's very much on my mind. Um, how do I tell my parents to stay away and not to come even though we live five minutes away from each other? How do I help them frame this as something that um, is not just going to be terribly lonely? Um, and maybe even as something that is an opportunity. Um, and is it my place to even say those kinds of things? Um, now you're all seeing my wonderful um, uh, uh, bedroom here in Jerusalem because one of the effects of Corona is that um, uh, we had to give up our office and give it to Zohar, my eldest daughter, so that she has her own room because she was sent into isolation after her teacher got Corona three weeks ago. So she was in isolation for two weeks. Um, she suffered through every moment of it in her own room and watched all of Gilmore Girls from beginning to end. So she's the happiest Corona teenager in the world. Um, and if you two are Gilmore Girl fans, please send me some, some interesting things to say, because that's the only topic of conversation in our house at the moment. Um, but I'm going to spare you the looks of my room and give you this wonderful virtual background. And I invite you to also stick a nice virtual background as we're playing around so that we keep it interesting. Um, and, um, and I also say, I want to say that I want to dedicate our learning um, uh, tonight. Um, to, uh, to William Helmreich, who uh, uh, passed away from Corona on Saturday. He is my cousin's uh, father-in-law, my wife's cousin's father-in-law. I didn't know him very well, but we had met a few times. Uh, he was a sociologist and actually got some coverage in the New York Times, you might have seen, because he wrote about walking throughout all the five boroughs of New York. He walked every block. He was a real character. And just think about the reality of like, his wife also has Corona. Um, his daughter and, and her husband is my cousin in Chicago, couldn't come to be at the funeral. Um, there's no Shiva, there's no Jewish burial. He was buried in a temporary burial. And they're saying that after this is all over that they'll, the Hever Kaddisha will rebury the body in a Jewish burial. So, and that's just one story out of thousands. And I'm sure many of you know other stories as well. Um, and I, I must say, like, I'm not so close to William Helmreich uh, or his wife. I know I speak to their, you know, cousins every few weeks. Um, but just the sense of the anonymity that is going to be forced on so many people, um, because so many people are going to be dying at the same amount of time. And how do we fight off that anonymity? And how do we make sure that at least the people who we're somehow connected to, we tell their story, we remember who they are. Um, and I see so many faces here, people that I know are, um, amazing at thinking about how do we create memory and how do we tell stories um, and how do we help people around us recognize the the greatness of this moment not just in just surviving the here and now which is a huge question 
but how do we also tell the story of what's happening here and create the memories of what's happening here? Um, and, um, and I think that that's part of the thing that, uh, that I think many Bronfmanim uh, are good at. We're storytellers. Um, and we think about not just the here and now, but also what's the wider picture, what's the not wider narrative. And I just want to encourage you and the people around you to also live through this time at that level because it's really important for us. It might feel a little gratuitous now, but it's gonna be really important in the long run. Um, and I say that also because I think the Passover Seder is about that. It's about recognizing what's happening right now and how do we turn that into a story and how do we connect it into a larger story of what's going on now. Um, and that's a bit of what I wanna share with you as we get started. Um, um, but I really can't help myself to say it's really good to see so many of you. So what I'm going to do just to get us started is I just want to say everyone's name, both because Zoom really makes it really easy, but also because I remember um, and I know almost all of you. Uh, and since um, and um, let's try and um, and just open this up. Let's see. Um, and then we'll then we'll get started with the real learning. But I'm just going to unmute you all. Really quickly, but it's really nice to see uh, Rina Yehuda, and it's nice to see Sarah Bamberger selling your kids. Yeah, I think that's pretty much fun to talk And see uh, Nick Renner and Diana Bloom and Saul and Shira and Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. I don't think we've met, so nice to meet you. And Taylor and Daniel, and it's been a long time. Uh, Talia and Nama, and I saw Nama, your son, for a second over there, which is amazing. And Racheli and Marnina, and Sarah Sachs, and Tamar Lindenbaum, who has too much sun behind her, and Nahani, and Becky, and Ethan, and Ellie, and Maya, and Antonia, and Raish, um, and Ellie, and, um, wow, and Michaela, and Judith, Becca, Zach, Rachel Bluth, Rachel Nussbaum, hello, number three. Wow, I haven't- Alicia. Alicia, hi Alicia, you've grown a lot since I saying. Hi Ariel, and another Ariel, Ari Allen, uh, Ariel Polystar, and Yoela, and Sonia. Some of you turned off your cameras, which is not fair. Uh, and so, Amy, Gabby, Ari, Jack, Lisa, Laura. Uh, Laura, it's really good to see you. So um, I just had to take that moment because it's really good to see everyone. And I hate these big anonymous Zooms, but I love being able to see so many people um, that I know and love. Um, so let's get started. Um, and I wanna start with three basic thoughts about Passover Seder um, that I think will help us just frame what's going on here. Tell me if you can see this. And if you have questions, thoughts, use the chat that we can all see and just throw in questions, ideas, links, um, so we can kind of have a Talmudic sidebar conversation as we're going through it. Um, I'll try to look at it as we're going along as well, but I think it's, uh, we're all multitaskers anyway. So instead of being in your Facebook or your WhatsApp during this session, why don't we all just hang out in the chat and we can see ideas there. Um, so how do we create mem a memorable Seder during memorable times? Um, and the ideas here are really all ideas that I've learned from my father, Noam, uh, who has been celebrating Passover Seders for so many years and for 45 years of marriage, has always hosted lots of guests and this year will be uh, with my mother, uh, just the two of them. Uh, they'll be zooming in during the Passover Seder to my sister who lives 10 minutes away from them. Um, and we'll do a big Zoom in the afternoon before Passover with the whole family, extended family. My sister in Boston, my sister in Beersheba, we'll talk a little bit about some ideas about what to do on that afternoon Zoom and what to do on that nighttime Zoom if you're doing those things. Um, but so much of, of what I learned from him uh, is really going to be brought out uh, to bear in the conversations we're going to have. And I think actually so many of you, I've actually studied Passover Seder with many of you. Um, so I'll try to do this. Um, but it's always good to go back to the basics. Um, and I just want to say that 10 minutes before we started the Zoom, I realized that the PowerPoint that I would prepared for five different lectures is all in Hebrew. And I hadn't made one in English. So I quickly put stuff together and try to make it into English. Um, but here I left a little bit of Hebrew because I couldn't, didn't have time to find a good translation. So if someone wants to put on the chat, Exodus chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, that would be awesome. Um, and here's what I wanna say. Um, we often think about the Passover Seder as a night of Exodus, a night of liberation, a night of getting out. 
And I think this year's Passover Seder, more than any year before, reminds us that actually Seder night takes place on the night before they left Egypt. What we're actually doing is we're going to act just like our ancestors did in Egypt, not after they left Egypt, but before they left Egypt. At the very moment in which God or some intense uh, force is going through the world, uh, going through Egypt and killing the firstborn. And the Jewish people are commanded to quarantine themselves in their homes um, with their families and eat a meal and put blood on the, on the doorposts so that the force that is the force of death will not enter their homes. Um, and I don't think I ever, you know, understood the depth of that moment and the darkness of that night. I brought here an illustration that Michel Kishka, our illustrator, created for our Israeli Haggadah. And um, I always focused on the last element of, of, this, of, the, of the story, you know, going out from the narrow to the wide, leaving the darkness of Egypt and into the light of the land of milk and honey. And suddenly this year, I realized how much Passover Seder is not about the liberation. It's not about the arrival in the land of milk and honey. It's about that dark night where we went into our homes. And if you look at the chat, you'll see uh, the verses. Do we have them? Um, thank you, Racheli. Um, and we're told, none of you shall go out the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, I'll just put it here in the chat for everyone to see. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. And I think that hope that this year by quarantining ourselves in our homes, that, um, that we will be passed over. Um, that the destroyer will not be allowed to enter into our homes or into our communities. And that the way we do that is by not just quarantining ourselves in our home, but actually turning it into a powerful moment of togetherness, into a meal, into a story to be told, and into a moment of faith. Um, and I think about how Emmanuel Levinas talks about the fact that believing in the Messiah is not about a kind of um, eschatological messianism, but rather it is a commandment to be optimistic. It's the commandment to believe that there's a happy end. As children, we would always watch movies and my father would walk in always either in the most inappropriate moment of the movie, I don't know if that would happen to you with your parents, or in the scariest moment of the movie. And then he'd be like, well, and we were like, this is so scary. And he'd say, then why are you watching it? And we'd say, because like, we like being scared. And he says, but is it going to end well? And he says, well, is, this, is it an American movie? And we would say, of course, it's an American movie. What do you think? We're watching some Eastern European uh, depressing stuff. And he says, uh, oh, if it's an American movie, there'll be a happy ending. All American movies have happy endings. And I think in many ways, this is kind of the moment that we're asking ourselves, is this American movie going to have a happy ending? And we're, we're not programmed to deal with other kinds of movies. Um, and I hope and I believe that there will be a happy ending to this movie. And I think it depends on a lot of us and it depends on our leaders. Um, and, but I think remembering also that the Passover Seder takes place in a moment that is not a happy moment, but it is a moment of faith and of trust and of finding, a, finding uh, hopefully some, some power and inspiration uh, within our own families. Um, so that's the, um, that's the Corona uh, Passover that we're all gonna celebrate in the connection, I think, to the, to the Egypt uh, Corona. Um, hang on, why am I not? Um, but the second Passover that we're celebrating is not just the Passover of Egypt itself, but the Passover of the rabbis. Because in many ways, Passover night is a, is a creation of rabbinic times. And uh, some of you have probably heard this before, um, but I think four basic elements that the rabbis created uh, a, a turned Passover into that weren't there before a really are, are a key part of our own Passover experience to this day. The first one is that the home is at the center. And 
I can't say enough how important that is. We talked about how the, in Egypt, um, the Seder was, the, was at home, was in the family nest, so to speak. But upon arriving in the land of Israel, Passover in temple times was not about the home at all. Passover in temple times was about the public sphere. It was about going to Jerusalem, going to the temple, and having your sacrifices there. Now, it's true that Passover was the time where every Jewish family could eat what the priests would usually eat. They could all eat the sacrifices. But Passover at home was, didn't exist. And after the destruction of the, of the temple, the rabbis make an intense shift of moving Judaism out of this temple and into a home, two homes, the Beit Knesset, the synagogue, and the Bait, the home. Now, we usually talk about the move to the synagogue and, uh, you know, uh, many of you might remember on Bronfman going to Caesarea and talking about the, the create or the Beit Sharim and seeing the synagogues. And we know that Jewish life also in America is so synagogue focused, but Passover highlights how much really Judaism is not a synagogue religion. It is first of all, a home religion. The Judaism that the rabbis created is a home religion where the table, the family table is the center. In fact, it is the altar. And the Talmud says, while the temple existed, every, the, the altar in Jerusalem uh, atoned for a person's actions. But now that the temple has been destroyed, a person's table is what atones for their actions. And this idea of the family table becoming the altar, becoming the place for sacred space, becoming the center of ritual, uh, exists in all kinds of elements, the Shabbat table, the singing, the Divrei Torah, the blessings, uh, the blessings of the children, but more than that, really, um, it, is, it is the Passover night that creates the, fam the table culture of the Jewish people. Now, the challenge is, of course, and we'll talk about this more, is what happens when I'm not used to having my table be the table that is the altar? I go to my parents, that's the altar. I go to my bubby, that's the altar. But my table with, with my, at my dorm, with my students, with my friends, it, you know, my, my, my bachelor pad, that, you know, or with my young family where we throw pasta on the floor, that's the altar. How do we make that um, into a, a, a moment that, that is altar worthy, so to speak? Um, so that's, uh, that's key number one to the rabbinic Passover. Um, the second one is that the rabbis say, on Passover night, we don't just want to create a memory. We want to tell a story that is experienced in the first person. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, in so many rabbinic commandments and Jewish commandments are about memory. I need to remember that we left Egypt. I need to remember that God created the world. I need to remember um, what Amalek did. Um, Passover night is not about memory. It's not just about memory. The goal of Passover night, we say every year as part of the Haggadah, in every generation a person should feel as if they themselves left Egypt. In other words, the goal of Passover is not to remember that, pa that the Exodus existed, but rather to feel as if I myself went out of Egypt. How do we turn a memory that, by the way, happened or didn't happen in, in history, how do we turn a memory into a first-person experience? And I think that's the challenge that the rabbis give us on Passover night. And the answer that they also give, they equip us with tools to, um, in, to deal with that and to, and to create that experience. And the first tool is that they have a pedagogic vision for Passover night. Passover night is not just a time for reading the Haggadah like a prayer book. And I, I think in this crowd, I, I'm pretty safe to say that none of you will be reading the Haggadah as a prayer book. But it's more than that, it's about looking at the Haggadah as an, uh, a series of educational experiences um, that we can create. Um, and the, big, the prime example for that is really the Manishtana, right? That, that moment when, um, when the rabbis teach us that what we need to do is we need to get our children to ask questions. And that moment of how do we get children to ask questions is really one of the, uh, one of the most important elements of the Haggadah. Um, I just want to look back with you at that, at that Mishnah. I'm wondering myself if I'm just, you know, uh, sending so, many, so much information your way, but I think it's just kind of a quick review of what Passover is about. Um, it wouldn't be Bronfman if we just had um, 
uh, if we don't have a good rabbinic text to look at. Um, so this is the, sec uh, the, the fourth Mishnah out of chapter 10 of Mishnah Psachim. And um, I think it's worth reading every year. And if I can actually ask, um, uh, Elena, can I pick on you for a second? Can you want to unmute yourself and read for us uh, the, this Mishnah? Great, I'll unmute you. Okay, start over. Okay. They pour a second cup of wine, and here the son asks of his father, and if the son does not have enough understanding, his father instructs him to ask. And do you want me to keep going? Uh, yeah. Okay. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat chametz or matzah, but on this night, only matzah. On right. all you other... To the bottom. So then we get three questions, four questions, and then just skip to the bottom. And according to the understanding of the son, his father instructs him. He begins with the disgrace and concludes with the glory. And he expounds upon the verse, Devarim 26.5, the Aramean sought to destroy my father until he ends the whole portion. So three things to really know from this Mishnah. We could talk for hours about this Mishnah, but three things that are really key understandings. The first one is, who asks, who sings Manishtana according to the Mishnah? And it's very clear, surprisingly, that the child is not supposed to sing Manishtana. The why is this night different from all other nights? In fact, it's an educational failure if you're singing Manishtana. What, what is supposed to happen instead? What's supposed to happen is the child is supposed to ask questions of their parents. Something about pouring that second cup of wine, I explained this just to my daughter this morning. She, you know, we were, we were talking about the Haggadah and she said, so why are there four cups of wine? And I said, well, you know how after we drink uh, Kiddush, you always ask for more Kedem grape juice, uh, which is what we buy here in Israel because my daughters spent too many years in America and they can't stand the Israeli kind. Um, as many cups as you want. You can have four cups of grape juice um, because we're free, we're, we're lavish. We're enjoying ourselves. But that moment when I'm gonna pour you your second cup of grape juice out of my own volition and not after you threw a temper tantrum is a moment where you're gonna pick up your eyes and say, wait, what, why is this night different from all other nights? Why don't I have to you know, protest for 20 minutes to get my second cup of grape juice? Why are you just pouring it out of your own free will? Um, and that's basically what's happening in the Mishnah, right? One cup of wine, that makes sense on a, on a, on a, on a festive meal. But two, that's a moment worth questioning. And only if the child doesn't know how to ask, only then is the father instructed to then teach the child how to ask questions. If the son does not have enough understanding, his father instructs him to ask. And so it's the father who sings Manishtana. And from that perspective, I think we can talk, we could have a much longer conversation about what does Manishtana mean? And I think one of the most convincing answers is Manishtana is about teaching a child how to ask questions. Or if you will, teaching a child how to be critical, teaching a child how to, how to identify difference, teaching a child uh, how to not take things for granted. And in so many ways, simply by asking questions, we are already free. We might not be able to change our historical situation. We might not be able to change our leadership. We might not, might not be, be able to change science or medicine or the reality around us. But by asking questions, we are already no longer slaves of the situation. And finally, for this point of the, edu of the pedagogical element of Passover Seder, the rabbis say on this whole night, the pedagogical rule is according to the understanding of the son, his father instructs him. In other words, we're required on this night, and here I say not just to parents, I see a lot of people here who aren't parents necessarily, but are going to be leading seders. On seder night, we are asked to be educators and to see our guests as people who are here to learn. And maybe we also switch roles. One moment you'll learn and the other one someone else will teach. Um, but thinking pedagogically about seder night is really something that the rabbi is instructed. And the first element of pedagogy, as we all know, is to think who is the student? What is she interested in? What does she want? What, 
what is bothering her in her world and how can I change the message so that she is, she is taking it in uh, out of her own volition. From that perspective, if we're all experiencing Corona, then this year we have to talk about Corona at our Seder table and try to find the connections and the combinations and understand what are the ways in which we are attuned in different ways to our own reality thanks to this. How do we appreciate questions, issues such as freedom and health and life and social responsibility and mutual responsibility um, because, of, because of what's going on around us? And how do we find that in the Seder and how do we find that um, in our own experience right now? Number four, and then we'll end with this part of, of our presentation, um, is that the rabbis say, it's not just about questions. It's not just about the home. It's not just about um, creating a first person story, but in order to create that first person story, we don't only have to be great pedagogues, pedagogues we also have to create really great experiences. We have to create an experiential evening. And let's just think about all the experiential elements of, of Passover night. And I actually wanna invite you to use the chat for a second. What are elements that we use in the Passover tradition uh, that are experiential? that are not just textual, right, or cognitive. Um, so just write, take a minute and write in in the chat. Um, we're moving to active learning. You notice my fancy pedagogy here over Zoom. Um, what, what are the different elements that, that we're using here? Okay, there we go. So I see here, Marnina says we wash hands and this year, the joke in Israel has been that the song should be this year, Kadesh Urchatz, Karpas Urchatz, Yachatz Urchatz, right? Everything you do and then you wash hands again. But even that hand washing is tactile, this experiential, right? Elena says we taste, we're eating. We're not, just, um, we're not just saying, oh, here are symbols of the Passover Seder. We're saying we're gonna eat those symbols. We're gonna taste what they taste like. We're gonna taste the same menu that our ancestors ate on that night of fear and trepidation uh, in Passover. We're eating the same menu that they ate, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. We're tasting the same things that they tasted. Dafikoman, we're turning a holy relic into a game. Um, and we're playing, we're being playful on the holiest of nights, right? We're dipping in salt water, so we're creating the experience of bitterness for ourselves or embodying it for a second. Um, and um, we have, right, the food traditions, taste, dipping, hitting each other over uh, with leeks. Ari is recalling the, the Persian tradition um, uh, of, of hitting each other over with leeks during the Dayenu, which is the most highly recommended custom uh, that all Jews should learn from the Persian Jews to do. Also in, uh, of course, in identification with the Iranian uh, uh, nation that is uh, in dire need. Um, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm actually not laughing at all. Um, which is making it playful and so on. I could go on. We sing the story. We ha have our body language. We recline. We have our body language reflect this. Uh, we have a Seder plate. All the props are on the table. We're not just telling a story. We create props on the table and we, we point at those props and we cover them and we uncover them and we pick them up and we use them. It's a really theatrical night in so many ways. Um, the mystery, the suspense, there's a drama to the night. It starts with affliction. It ends with, with joyous uh, learning. Um, and Rachel says, we ingest the story, right? We're internalizing the message. We literally ingest the, the story. We're empathic as we're learning in so many ways. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, the, the list could go on and on of all the ways in which that's experienced. And so just to recap on that, the home is at the center. There are no other authorities. There's a text and there's a tradition but the conduit for the text and the conduit for the tradition is ourselves. Um, second of all, um, we are trying to create a story that people will identify with, that they'll come out of this and say, this is my story. I'm shaping my life be in, uh, in, according to the story in so many ways. Um, third of all, we have a pedagogic vision. We are all asked to be educators, to make a plan for our Passover Seder, to think about how we're going to play this out with the audience that we have in the room. Every Passover Seder needs to be different because the audience is different every year. And finally, we're trying to create an experience because it's really only experiences that are effective. Um, and they, they are what make it all happen. One last thing that I didn't stress enough and I should have stressed in this context is the last part of that Mishnah says, you expound 
upon the words, er, my father was a wandering Aramean. This is, by the way, the big educational failure of the Passover Seder. The rabbis imagined the Passover Seder being a Beit Midrash, a place where we bring six verses from the Torah and we create Midrashim on those verses. But of course, what happened? People took the Beit Midrash that the rabbis created on those six verses of my father was a wandering Aramean and just copy pasted their Midrash into the Passover Haggadah. And then what we all do is, if we're reading the traditional Haggadah, we're reading their Midrash, right? The record of their Beit Midrash on those verses. So this is a part of the class I usually don't get to, but in a context like Bronfman, where we're all Beit Midrash people, um, have fond memories of Beit Midrash, and I think recreate Beit Midrash uh, wherever we are in whatever language we're speaking. Um, Seder night is an invitation to recreate a Beit Midrash, and especially if you have, you know, if you have a Seder for, with kids, then maybe it's much harder to create a Beit Midrash. But if you have a Seder of people in their 20s and 30s, um, it's a great opportunity to actually try to create a Beit Midrash. Find a text that can be studied and expounded upon. And if you're sticking to the traditional text of the Haggadah, all the Midrash, all the Midrashim, all that part after my father was a wandering Aramean until the 10 plagues, you can skip that whole part simply by creating your own Midrash on those very same verses. Um, so turn this night into a Beit Midrash. That's what the rabbis envisioned. Uh, they failed in many ways, um, but I think we can succeed uh, where previous generations have failed. Um, so here's what I want to uh, suggest at this point. Um, let's go back and out into the breakout groups. And I want you to take these ideas and themes, and I want to ask you two questions. One is, uh, are, you know, choose one theme that resonated with you in the Passovers that you grew up with. Something that you want to make sure that at, at your Passover table, wherever it is, whenever it is, that you'll be recreating that element. Um, and if it resonates with one of the four elements I brought here, great. And if it's something totally different, that's also great. But something that you want to bring from your family Passover table to the Passover table that you are now no longer a guest at, but are a leader at. Um, and the second question is, what is, um, you know, this year as we're, um, how is this night different from all other nights, right? What is one way in which you think the lessons of, uh, of the Passover Seder can be, uh, can be relevant um, for us? Um, let me just, I see Becca's request here. So I'm going to, I'm going to put into the chat the four uh, elements. Um, and I see some of you have to sign off. So it's really good to see uh, your faces, but let's try. Oh, here we go. Becky's way ahead of me as always. Those are the two questions for the breakout. And here are the four elements of the rabbinic Seder. Um, so take those two elements. What is it that you're bringing from your family and what are you, um, um, and, and what is it that you think can be relevant this year? Sarah, I see your question. We'll, we'll definitely try to get back to that in the breakouts uh, or when we all get back together. Penina, let's give it a good 12 minutes. Um, okay, I think do you want them to close automatically or do you want to just let me know oh. when you want them to be closed? Um, I'll tell you what, I actually, I think, I'm thinking of Taylor's question and I, in any other Zoom conversation, I would keep it short, but actually, um, Knowing this group, I think we can even go for 20 minutes. Is that okay, Becky? I just think people can, if you need to leave, that's fine. Uh, groups of three, and if you, if you, if you don't have enough people, um, uh, I think we have time to hear from uh, in two or three breakout groups, just one idea that you heard or something inspiring that you wanna take with you that you might wanna share back with the group. Um, so let's take two or three um, perspectives or if you're just one of those people that really wants to speak on a Zoom call to feel that you're actually alive, um, yeah, that's also okay. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll wrap it up with a few, with a few last ideas. Um, so something you heard in your breakout room uh, from someone else and you wanna share uh, or that really gave you inspiration, um, you can unmute yourself and, um, and go for it. Not afraid of awkward silences in a Bronfman space. Um, I'll just, I'll say that um, 
there were a lot of interesting things that we were talking about um, towards the, just as we were moved back out of the breakout room, um, Ariel was saying that it would be really interesting to have a better sense of what kinds of like supplements were, were written during the time of the Spanish flu, for example, or what kinds of um, additional, hmm. um, you know, kind of reflections were added into the Seder at different moments um, in history where there were major upheavals. And, and then that led into a, a piece about just kind of like what things stick. So Maya in my group was also talking about how her family always um, marks the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising on the Seder night, which is um, a tradition that I had never heard of, but I'm now very interested in. Um, so, so we were just kind of like talking about like in what ways have we historically um, dealt with these kinds of moments of major shift within the Seder itself. Mm. And how we actually have a tradition of, of weaving in, um, you know, dire moments um, into the Passovers, right? The, some of the Passover hymns that we read, the songs at the end were written during the times of the Crusades. Um, the, that moment of asking for vengeance, um, it was also added after the Crusades. So there's like uh, different layers. There was all discussion of how to, how does the, maybe you need to add, add a fifth cup of wine after the creation of the state of Israel. So like the, 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 the Haggadah and the Passover Seder changes with Jewish history. Um, and that's part of the evolving story in so many ways. Mish, I was very privileged to grow up with the Haggadah that's being featured right behind you. Mm -hmm. um, and I always appreciated that was like whenever I got bored, I would always read about things like the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising or the corollaries between what's happening, what happened to the Jews and, and civil rights movements and all of that poetry. And something that just popped to my head now is I'm excited for the next version of this Haggadah that includes the responses to COVID-19 and how we celebrate it. Exactly. Well, I can tell you that my father's already been working on the coronavirus uh, Passover manual that should be going up online tomorrow. I'll, send, I'll be sure to send it on the Bronfman list. Uh, Michael Paley, who I see here, will probably you know, recognize uh, in my father's ability to uh, always connect whatever is going on into, uh, into the Weaver Jewish tradition. Sometimes it's more effective and sometimes less. Um, Anyone else? Uh, one more thought, something you heard or something you want to share here that's inspiring? Mostly more, by the way. Mostly Michael. More. What's that? Your father mostly connects it more. He connects it more, exactly. Taught more. lots of things at the beginning of the sessions in Hungary and Poland, where I am, and uh, people still talk about that and we'll weave it into this sad but still inspiring Seder. Hmm. I have a question about your father's materials. Mish, this is Ellie. Yeah, Ellie. Um, are they going to be in Hebrew or English or both? They will be in English. Okay. Yeah. I'll send them out and they'll also be. I also said, I mentioned this to Rachel and our, uh, Rachel Booth in our breakout. Um, the, the, the full uh, PDF of a different night uh, is open online, available on the Haggadahs R Us website, tackiest name ever. Um, but um, I'll send that out as well and just uh, opening it up so that anyone can print it wherever you are and use pages of it. Um, and maybe we should think of how to, um, <clears throat> how to um, publicize that more widely because I think until the Zoom call, I didn't realize how many people are stuck in all kinds of different places and don't have their usual books with them. Um, so that's, uh, that's very helpful. I did just okay, see so that PJ Library, you can download there if, you're, if you want to. Oh, awesome. Them. You can and download there if I got it as well. Yeah, for free. It's a free PDF. Awesome. Did Maxwell House also allow you to print there on PDF? You have to feel like it's the original text. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so I want to um, um, I want to go back to um, I want to close the session with with um, a, a few last ideas. One is really what we just talked about now. Hey, can you see this? It is. Um, I just put together a few different covers of Haggadot to really talk about, I think that, I mean, this is what we just talked about now, is how the Haggadah changes as Jewish history changes. And just to note how within American tradition itself, we have generations of different Haggadot. And I wanna just talk about that for a second as an inspiration for creating our own 
sort of COVID-19 Haggadot, as someone said just now. Um, on the left, you'll see, or on the right, you'll see a, a picture from a, 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 the first Haggadah printed in America in 18, uh, I think it's 1886 um, in, in Chicago, um, with an illustration of the four children sitting around the table. And if you studied uh, with me before, or, uh, you've probably seen this picture because it's one of my favorite four children, four sons. Um, and this is really the moment here, Ellie, this is for you, Jewish history buff. Um, so the, this is a Haggadah written by German Jews uh, living in America, making it out to Chicago as part of kind of the industri industrial town. And you can see the father is dressed like a traditional German Jew with a white uh, kittel um, and that we sometimes wear on Yom Kippur. German Jews also wear it on Passover night. Uh, and his son, the wise son, reading a book with a head covering, uh, wearing the same traditional clothes of his father, just like we did in Germany. Um, and then you see who's the wicked son, right? It's clearly the, the, the one who's smoking. And he's wearing a smoking jacket as well. He's wearing modern clothes. He's the new American. By the way, I don't think his smoking is considered evil as much as I think it's just being considered modern, right? A modern man smokes. Uh, but you can see his body language kind of sitting back and saying, what is this work for you? This means nothing. And you see that the younger two children, the simple child and the one who doesn't know how to ask, they're obviously looking at the evil child. He's the one that's drawing all the attention. He's the future. He's the interest. And this moment of this generational turn um, around the table and the gap between the generations, I think in so many ways, <clears throat> This idea of Passover night as being a night of generations and of one generation passing the story to the next generation, that's the very basic element of any culture. And it's the basic element of, of Passover night. What does it mean to have a Passover night where we can't be several generations together? Where that in itself is what endangers us, right? We have thrived as a culture and as a society and as a religion by passing on stories from one generation to the next. And tonight, or this year, we won't be able to commune between generations in the usual ways that we do. Um, so that's sort of one element of, of the challenge of it, but the way in which American Jews have kind of imprinted their story into their Passover Haggadot. Uh, the second generation of Passover Haggadot is the one, is the Maxwell House Haggadah, right? And I have here about eight different covers. You can see how it evolved over the years. Um, if you don't know, this is a Haggadah that you would get for free in the supermarket when you buy kosher for Passover Maxwell House coffee. And this idea of a non-Jewish company, I think it was at the time, creating a product for specifically for Jews, but that's sold in the supermarkets with everyone else, really has a, is a big statement about, about Jewish assimilation in America. Right? We're not ashamed to sell a Haggadah in a supermarket that has non-Jews buying it as well, or having you know, the way that, that Judaism and consumerism are so tightly connected not necessarily in a negative way, um, and the way in which um, the, the, the cover changes. At the same time, the text of the Haggadah and the Maxwell House Haggadah is the traditional text. And it's really interesting in a country where most Jews are conservative or reformed Jews, and so they change the text of the Haggadah. Um, I think the fact that the Maxwell House Coffee Haggadah stayed with the traditional text is one of the reasons why many American Jews are still very connected to the traditional Haggadah text, despite the denominations creating all kinds of different versions of the text. So it's just an interesting point. Um, Arthur Waskow in the 70s um, created the Freedom Haggadah, um, uh, the Freedom Seder, uh, a radical rereading and rewriting of the Passover Haggadah uh, to connect with the elements of the 60s, of the Black Panthers, of Jews fighting for freedom. Um, and in many ways, I think my father, a different night, is part of that same uh, milieu uh, that Michael also knows well of sort of Havarad Jews saying we can rewrite this tradition. We don't need to be a denomination to rewrite our Haggadah. We can do a do-it-yourself Haggadah. We can recreate the text, recreate the story alongside our political identification, alongside our ethics, our beliefs. Um, every family rewrites their own Haggadah. Uh, Edgar Bronfman's Haggadah, uh, which too bad I don't have it here on, on, on the screen, but is in many ways also um, a, you know, a family writing their own Haggadah. And that tradition, that idea of a family writing their own Haggadah 
is really an involvement, I think, uh, of American Judaism. Uh, and the height of it also, and, and the changes with technology, and the height of it is Hagadot.com, which is a really great website that's perfectly aligned for, for this year. If you don't have an account on Hagadot.com, now's the time to go and create it and to donate $18 to them while you're at it, because what they do is really give the tools to any one of us to create our own Haggadah text in so many ways. So four generations of Passover Haggadot in the American tradition that each one kind of tells the story of what it means to be um, an American Jew at, at a specific time. Um, and I wanna, um, I wanna, oh wait, shared the wrong screen. Okay. Um, I wanna end with um, tips. And I think we kind of already had this throughout the session, but just to kind of recap, five tips for a successful Seder. Tip number one, if you're hosting a Seder, is make a plan and prepare for the Seder. And the first thing you need to make a plan about is food. When are we gonna eat? Don't fall into the trap of having your guests, children, parents, friends, being starving and turn it, the Karpas moment in the Passover Seder, sorry, turn the storytelling moment of the Seder from a moment of starving to a moment of snacking. And the way to make that move is by the third step of the Seder, Karpas, where we usually eat a bit of parsley and salt water or a potato or celery. The origin of that tradition is the Greek symposium, the Greek symposium in which you would eat Karpos, which means Greek, in Greek, I'm told, means vegetables. Um, and you would eat karpos dipped in sauces. And the idea was not just to eat a tiny bit at the beginning in a symbolic way, but rather as we're having our symposium, talking not about what is the meaning of love as Plato would have it, but talking about what is the meaning of freedom or what is our story? Where, are we, where did we come from and where are we going? Whatever it is we're talking about, let's not starve while we're doing it, let's snack. So prepare on your menu as many vegetables and dips as you can, potato chips, artichokes, carrot sticks, celery. Um, we're, we this year are gonna be serving gefilte fish uh, and chopped liver uh, as part of the karpas because um, we're gonna be dipping them in crane. Um, and it's just a great way to get people to be snacking throughout the Seder. I will say the rabbi and me cautions, uh, make sure you're not full before you eat the matzah. You're supposed to be you know, you're supposed to want to eat the matzah. It is a mitzvah. It is one of the central mitzvahs of the night. So don't lose your appetite, but move from starving to snacking. Number two, um, the Haggadah is not a prayer book to be read from beginning to end. The Haggadah is a, a series of activities um, that, um, that we're invited to do and a series of opportunities for storytelling. You had all the answers before. We sing the story, we eat the story, we create symbols out of the story. We make games out of the story. Look at every part of the Haggadah as an opportunity to do an activity and try to understand what is that activity. If you open up a different night or a night to remember the Haggadah for my family, you'll see there how we encourage every moment to be an activity. A Beit Midrash is also an activity as opposed to just reading a text from the Haggadah. Um, not that there's anything bad with reading the text. Sometimes that's just what you need to do. Um, Tip number three, turn your guests from spectators into allies. Um, get them to be involved, have them be co-leaders or mini leaders of different segments of the Seder. Even if they're six years old, they can have a part of the Haggadah that they feel responsible for, um, that they're asked to bring their uh, expertise and experience and ideas from. Your non-Jewish friends at the Seder can get a part of the Haggadah that are, they're told Share what you have to say about this element, about this idea. Where does this fit in your family tradition or what does this remind you of? Um, they'll feel more empowered and can sometimes um, uh, step up to the game uh, much better than those who, for whom this is uh, their 20th Passover Seder. So how do, uh, think about how to turn your guests from spectators to allies. Number four, uh, the pregame. Um, uh, here I wrote from preparing to planning and I already kind of talked about that you know, we often spend a lot of energy preparing the food, preparing the cleaning, preparing the guest list, take some of that time and plan the pedagogical elements of, and the playful elements of your Passover Seder. Go over the text, think about when people will be hungry, what they'll want, how are you gonna move people around the room? Um, 
so that's uh, I think that'll uh, be um, um, be really helpful. Um, and finally, uh, tradition is really important on this year. Shake it up, but keep it recognizable. At the end, we do the Passover Seder, not because it's the best experience ever. We do it because we do it, because we've done it for 2,000 years. And that's important. Um, and I think that um, uh, as much as I've said that this needs to be a, a, a first person storytelling and an experience and, and educational and so on, it really is about the tradition in so many ways. Um, which brings me to um, tips for a Corona Seder. Um, so here are my thoughts, and I'd love to hear yours as well, either by the chat, through chat or through comments uh, after this. Um, number one is our challenge is to feel together despite social distancing. Um, and I really, um, I was complaining to Emma Goldberg, who I was talking to before on the phone, about how the term social distancing is a really unfortunate term. We should be talking about physical distancing um, and social closeness. And how do we do that, I think is the question. And Passover is a time of social closeness. Um, if we can't do physical closeness, let's at least do social closeness in different ways. And I think that really framing that for our families, for our parents, for our cousins uh, is, is important. So what can we do with the people who we were supposed to celebrate Seder with? So here are some ideas. One is eat the same menu. All the people who you were supposed to have Seder with, eat the same food. Um, share recipes with each other. Ha everyone had, we're gonna all be making my grandmother's mocha bars. Um, and just by eating the same foods, we'll feel closer together. Um, um, sing the same tunes, call up your parents and learn from them how do they do the tune for Kiddush or the tune for Chad Gadia and sing their tunes. Um, and if you have a few people from different families, maybe every, if people have different traditions for saying Kiddush, if they know how to say Kiddush or different tunes, it's not about fighting which tune is the right tune, but rather sing all the tunes so that all the families get a presence at the table. Um, send pictures of your uh, Passover tables or put place names, even for the people who you were supposed to have Seder with, but aren't uh, at, your, at, at your table. Uh, share customs. If your family beats each other over the head with leeks, um, then, uh, uh, then that's the way to do it. And I see here Taylor's reminding us finding the Afikoman virtually is going to be quite a feat. One of the ideas I heard this week is to um, have the grandparents who aren't at the Seder give the tips um, to the kids of where to find the Afikoman. So not just, you know, doing a Zoom Seder is one idea, but even just calling them in or having them send messages or pictures that tell the kids where the Afikoman is, um, I think that that's a really, um, just a great way to involve them in the games. Um, Ilana Weinstein says it's hiding on the second page of the Google search, so no one will ever find it in that case. Um, okay, so which brings me to how do you run a Zoom Seder? We don't know because we haven't done it that often, but Marnina has a good uh, suggestion here. She says, uh, only the song leader should be singing. So first of all, I trust Marnina on any singing tips uh, ever. Um, but I will say, I think we've all discovered in the last two weeks, synchronous singing on Zoom doesn't work. Um, uh, it sounds horrible. It's still worth doing because you feel together. But you do it once and you get over it. Um, can, I, can I offer something, Mish? Um, yeah, our fellows, uh, which I was sharing for those of you that were on at the start of the call for their spring seminar, one of the things that they did was they found music that they played for, for example, Kabbalat Shabbat. Um, they had everyone on mute except for one person and they sort of switched between people. So you got to hear one person along with music in the background while everyone else was singing. And there was something really unifying about that. So I just wanted to like offer that tip because you can't really have everyone unmuted or if you do as, as you said, Mish, it's not very comfortable, but, um, but there was something cool about, about that approach. It was cool and very disorganized. <laughs> As it should be. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was very, like, very, very fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I want to say what I think about the, Zoom, uh, the idea of a Zoom Seder, and then I'd really love to hear your thoughts on what you're planning to do. My sense is that trying to do the whole Seder on Zoom is a bad idea for two reasons. One, um, you end up spending a lot of energy managing the Zoom. 
And even if you do it, you know, and these are all good practices, put it up on a big screen. Um, you know, if you're keeping halacha, if you're, if you're halachically observant over the chag, and you turn on the Zoom in advance, then think about how you can, you know, manage that in different ways. And some rabbis have been writing some really helpful stuff in all kinds of ways. But, um, but, um, but my sense is that the, the challenge with the Zoom Seder is that it takes away from the ability to have an experience at the table itself. And so I think what we need to do is we need to find a way on one hand to make sure that people who are alone or feel alone, even if there are just two or three of them, that they are connected um, by Zoom, with the Zoom experience at some point during the evening or in the afternoon. But at the same time, allow your own family or your own group of friends or your own couple to have the experience um, uh, of the physical presence and the, and the lively conversation that can happen from that. So I would recommend finding a section, an agreed section that that we're all gonna do together. For example, if you're zooming in with your relatives, do kiddush together, then disconnect, and then reconnect for manishtana, right? Um, or have a pre tailgate the seder, right? Is that the right word? Um, right? Have a pre seder party, right? In the afternoon before. Um, and uh, Michael says it's okay. My sports, my American sports analogies are okay. Um, Right, have a pre-Passover party uh, on the afternoon before, have everyone call in and do a few things together. Um, and I wanna, I, I wrote up just to, and I'm, I'm actually really asking you here because I'm about to write this up in a few other, uh, on a few other places, I wonder if this idea works. What do you do in a, in a uh, you know, as if you're ta tailgating on, on Passover? What I would do as a family is I would say, do four questions, three songs, two stories, and one picture. In other words, first of all, when you're with a family, start with the four questions. The, the kibbutzim in the early uh, used to write their own Haggadot, and they would ask contemporary questions, not just the four questions of Manishtana, but ask their own questions. And just like the rabbis of the Mishnah suggest, have everyone say, how is this night different from all other nights? And just go around trying to ask as many ways in which this night is different, the four questions. Then, Sing three songs together. Sing the Manishtana, or have the youngest person present sing the Manishtana and everyone can clap. And then sing Dayenu, because we're feeling thankful, or sing Chad Gadya, or sing some of the favorite songs that you have from the Seder. Um, share two stories or two words of Torah or of wisdom. Um, have two people on the call share something that's a little bit deep, that's meaningful, an idea. Teenagers writing up something that they wrote, or a grandparent or a grandmother reading uh, something that she wrote, a poem, something like that. And finally, take a picture together um, in, in some way and send it out so that you have a memory from this very strange and different night. Uh, if you're calling your parents, um, have them give the, the parental uh, blessing. That's a tradition uh, and a tearjerker uh, and something that's really worth doing. So I think those are, I'm just trying to give some sort of structure to this idea of, of how to do, um, how to create a moment of being, feeling together, even though we're distant. And at the same time, I, I think that allowing those of us who have a family or friends with us, don't, you know, push the whole thing over to the virtual realm, keep, keep the physical uh, encounter at the center as well. Um, Mish, so as, you know, as we're, yeah. as we're concluding, and I know that, that, um, we're a little past time, but but just noticing that in the chat, there's a, a number of questions that I think might you might be able to combine a, a, any kind of response you can offer related to those who are doing Seder on their own and perhaps won't have access to Zoom or other technology or those who are doing Seders that's not at all intergenerational, right? Not children and adults, it's really just a group of adults or, um, or things of that sort. And just to be of any additional thoughts for those folks as we start to wrap up. Okay. First of all, I want to copy and paste all these comments so I can look at them more later and I don't want them to disappear at the end of this Zoom call. Um, um, but, so let me just do that for a second. Um, so Becky said, what, what happens if you're just a group of adults? It's not an intergenerational Seder. What happens if you're alone on Seder night? 
Um, let's let's tr try to focus on a few of these. Um, so, um, um, and I see Taylor suggesting to blow shofar on pass overnight. I think we have a new tradition that will probably uh, very quickly uh, become relevant uh, in all ways. So uh, there is a tradition of on your days of celebration, uh, having a blast of the shofar. So I think that's, that's meaningful in some ways. Um, I think, first of all, um, what do you do if you're on your own for Seder? Um, and um, the Talmud actually asks this question itself, right? It says, um, the Mishnah says, the child asks the father. But what happens if there are no children at the Seder? Then they say, your wife asks you, which of course we would say, or you ask your wife, right? Or you ask your spouse. Um, and if you're alone, you ask yourself. And part of what the message behind that is, is to say, there, if no one else is the audience for the story, we are the audience for the story. We are, we are the audience of ourselves. We are the audience of accepting the story. And just perceiving ourselves as the audience, I think is really important. I think we sometimes hide behind having to do something for someone else and miss out ourselves as, as a focus. Um, having said that, I think that there are, there's, um, if you are someone who ritual is important to you, you can and should do the ritual on your own. Uh, read the texts, say the blessings. It is effective and impactful and meaningful. Uh, if you're not a person of holding ritual on your own, um, then I, there will be live broadcasts of Passover seders and streamings of Passover seders and connecting to them, I think is really meaningful. Um, but set the table for yourself and eat the foods and have at least some of the experiential elements on their own. Again, whatever uh, feels good. And I think most important is take care of yourself um, because in this time, self-care is super important. And that's not a value instead of the Passover Seder. Passover Seder is part of a Jewish tradition. And the first teaching of the Jewish tradition is self-care, loving life, keeping yourself safe and wellness. And during this time, that's the most important thing. So if what feels right for you is not to do a Passover Seder and just Netflix the night out, then that's probably the mitzvah that you need to fulfill at that time. And I, I, I'm saying that totally unapologetically. And I'm saying that also uh, as a message to share with other people, if you feel that's a message that they need to hear. Um, um, if you're a group of young adults or not young adults doing a Passover Seder together, you're very lucky. Uh, I'm jealous. I think that's one of the really great ways to have a Passover Seder. It can be an intellectual experience. You can learn, you can study, you can sing the songs if you want to. You cannot sing the songs if you're not people who sing songs, um, but turn it into an adult experience. And that idea of the Beit Midrash, um, I think is a really important one that the rabbis wanted. So for example, what I would do in a, in a, in a, in a Seder like that is I would have each guest really um, in advance, have each guest take ownership of a part of the Haggadah, a uh, part of the Seder that they want to talk about. You're a teacher, talk about the four children. You're a psychologist, talk about what freedom means. Um, <clears throat> you're a cook, talk about Pesach Matzah Maror and what it means to taste food. Um, and you're a doctor, talk about the 10 plagues. I am, it, find something that connects to people's expertise and let them bring their expertise to the table and let them shine with their knowledge and connect it um, it, to, the, to the themes of the Seder. It requires you as a Seder leader to know what the different parts of the Haggadah is so that you can really bring people to, to show their strengths throughout the Seder. Um, those, are, those are some of my thoughts for today. Thank you, Mish. This was wonderful and just also beautiful to be all together. And Mish, you're very much part of this community and at the heart of things. So thank you for stepping up in this moment and bringing this Torah to us. Um, and wishing everyone a wonderful Pesach. And it's been great to see the ways that we've been able to utilize our listserv and our other tools as a community to share ideas and to, to share support. And I encourage folks to keep doing that or to bring some of the energy from this session back into the community in other forms as well. Um, and, and really, yeah, a healthy and kosher Pesach for everybody. Um, and Mish, thank you again, really. It was great. Thank you all. Really good to see all your faces and hear some of your voices and really wishing you a wonderful Passover.
Uh, why don't we just unmute ourselves and wish a Chag Sameach or a, a happy Passover for, for a minute? I think. Chag Sameach, the Shana Bab Yerushalayim. Thanks. We're in Budapest. Thanks, Sameach. We're in Budapest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hello. I'm trying to leave. Ah, how does this work? Hello. Bye. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye, Nina. Thank you. Of course. Am I good to sign out? You are. Thank you so much, Nina.